Russia, 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 da, da. It's time to look at Russia. Right then, the Kirov class cruisers. And this time we're talking about the really big ships. We're talking about those vessels which displace some region of 28,000 tons fully loaded. A fact which made them heavier than the Invincible class. They are not small ships. They're incredibly capable ships, and they have to be, because the reason they are constructed. The Soviet Union of the 1970s is never going to build a navy which is for a peer-on-peer -peer conflict, as in terms of to challenge American status. They're not going to build a navy full of aircraft carriers because, again, they're always going to be at a disadvantage. Look at the current Chinese carrier and the issues it has with its presentation. Almost everything is compared to an American carrier, and whether it's lacking or not is declared to be lacking. The British have the same fun with the Queen Elizabeth class. And, you know, for both those subjects, you can find a mound of newspaper articles written by people which basically goes, oh, it, it has, it's not fitted with this or this. And you sit there and go, well, it was just launched. It hasn't been commissioned. I'm not surprised it doesn't have radar and missiles on it yet. That usually happens after it's launched because, believe it or not, going through the process of launching is not good for those things. And again, when the Queen Elizabeth class carries, they're not catabar. They're not catapult assisted barrier recovery. They're not. No. If there are reasons for them not to be, it's fine. It's. It, it's more about your operational type and your concept of what, what your operation is going to be than whether or not it's necessary to have that. And also, there's the cost factor. If How many air, air wings are you planning on having? How many carriers are you planning on completely being completely dependent upon the US for training, etc.? If so, then maybe Catabar is the sensible way to go. If not, then the system we've gone with is fairly decent. As it was, the Soviet Union ended up going with Stobar for the Kuznetsov class, which are important to think about because the Kuznetsov, along with Oscars, are the two other classes which carry the P-700 Granite, or, or as more often referred to, the SSN-19 Shipwreck. Mm, theoretically anti-ship missile, but could also attack land targets, and let's be honest, if you're packing a 750 kilogram conventional warhead or a 500 kiloton nuclear warhead, Eva's going to give you enough firepower to be a very scary vessel. And by the way, these things carry 20 of them. So why are the Kiros built? Well, if you're not going to fight a peer on peer war, as going contesting the Blue Oceans with a battle fleet, etc. That's the thing. What are you building large ships for? Well, as Gorshkov would tell you, there's a lot more to fighting a war than just the actual wartime. There's fighting the peace. Useful. Very useful. Large status unit doesn't require a battle group to go around. No one actually quite has a ship which can match up against it. If you think about it, if this thing turns up, well... What do you send? Do you send the carrier battle group? That looks like you're scared. Do you send a destroyer or a cruiser of your own? They're going to look titchy compared to this thing. They're going to be tiny. They're not going to be nuclear powered. They're not going to have all those masses of missiles or all those helicopters. Yes, you can sit there and go, but ours is technologically more advanced. It has the Aegis system and this and that. And you are true. You are talking the truth. But you're also dealing the fact that most people don't do that much of study, uh, uh, depth of study. And what they're going to see is that thing looks massive and is nuclear powered. And they're just going to go, cool. And then yours is not going to look the same. Maybe a Zumwalt class could match in pretty much to it. Because the Zumwalt looks weird and futuristic and cool like that. But even that's going to have a little bit of a trouble. 
because they're going to look at that and go, uh, yeah, but is it somewhat nuclear powered? Nope. But it has all this fancy technology. Yeah, but it's not nuclear. And as we all know, nuclear is new and cool and sexy. So it's a great status unit for sailing around the world and maximizing Soviet presence and Soviet naval diplomacy. Gorshkov, happy. Second point, wartime. Well, what's their wartime roles? Well, their first one is to be part of the Bastion Protection Force. The Bastions, of course, being set up to provide protection for the ballistic missile submarines, that core part of the triad of the deterrence that the Soviet Union depended upon in mutually assured destruction in later Cold War era. Okay, cool. What are they going to bring to that? Well, command and control facilities, those 20 shipwreck missiles, um, a fairly large and gregarious suite of anti-aircraft systems, and honestly, they will form the cornerstone of surface action groups, backing up submarines, probably acting in concert with an aircraft carrier of maybe the Kiev class or the Kuznetsov class, and Oscar class SSGNs and various attack subs, to provide a naval combined arms version of what the Soviet army liked to do ashore, which was bring everything to the fight in one go and overwhelm your enemy by attacking with mass from multiple directions. Again, that's probably the only way you have a chance of really beating Aegis. We often discuss this on various pro uh, various points of naval history. I discussed this on armchair admirals and on with World of Warships, and I've discussed this on Bill Trumps with Simsec with the team we have there. Bill Trumps, of course, is the podcast, which me, Jamie Seidel, and Drak NFL do together for Simsec, Center for International Maritime Security. By the way, neither of those groups have sponsored or anything of this video, but it's just worthwhile mentioning. They provide a lot of capability if you're doing a mass attack, if you're bringing this all arms, combined arms approach, if you've got submarines attacking, their, doing an attack with their torpedoes and getting in close to that. So you've got your anti-submarine warfare escorts are both having to deal with submarines or somewhere around here and enemy enemy missiles are coming in and perhaps enemy aircraft bombers are, which is gonna affect your, how you're operating your helicopters because the helicopters are going to have to get out of the way, because otherwise you might shoot them down with your own missiles. And your helicopters are your primary anti-submarine weapon. So if you've got submarines and missiles coming in, you've automatically started to limit the ASW capacity. If your anti-aircraft uh, air escorts are being worried about hitting their own submarine uh, and helicopters in a blue on blue, and are therefore trying to deal with missiles, and there's bombers, and the missiles are coming in from multiple angles, that again will uh, help to overwhelm them. Yes, you can have well-trained crews. Yes, they can do a sector defense system. Yes, you can have protocols in place for dealing with all of this. But it's also all being done by humans. And squidgy organic bits sometimes make a mistake under pressure. And even when you have computers involved doing it, Computers can make a mistake under pressure because computers are programmed by squidgy organic bits known as humans. And if it's programmed by a human, it could have a problem in it. It could be that the human programmer didn't factor in what happens in this scenario when you've got all these things happening at once and all sorts of things going wrong. Because a program is usually programmed for things going as planned i.e. the helicopters dodging out the way or descending to the self, uh, self, uh, safe altitude or whatever they do. And then you have a helicopter which actually has had an emergency or it's not in a normal position. It's been doing dipping sonar some way and it's lost its sonar, so it's doing emergency flight back in to pick up a new dipping, uh, dipping array from the, uh, its mothership. All of these are options and all of them can overwhelm a task group. So that's what it does in Bastion Defense. What does it do if it's not, though, in Russian territory? I've just said earlier, its primary role in peacetime is sailing around the world, being a big flag, being a status ship, being a statement status ship. It's not just status, as in turning up, we have the biggest cruiser. It's a statement, we have the biggest cruiser. 
yeah, look at how powerful we are. Well, this is where the Soviet Union's study of German surface raiders comes in. And if ever you go to the National Archives in the UK, in Q, it's a lovely place. But if you go and search ADM, uh, ADM, that's the Amalty Papers, you will find in there a whole slew of papers which were gathered by various intelligence apparatus, which were reports produced by the Soviet Union on the utility and usefulness of surface raiders in World War II. And before you start thinking about, well, you know, the surface raiders will be quickly sunk, there's satellites, all sorts of things, all true. But to actually sink them, and remember, if you're hunting down something the size and capability of this, you better bring a lot of stuff to play. You know, it's you're going to have to send an attack sub or quite a strong task group or a, far, a fairly large number of aircraft to guarantee a kill. Because remember, it's got nuclear power and it can just keep going everywhere at 20 knots. Well, what they found was that, and what really interested the Soviet Union, was that it tied up a lot of forces, a lot of British and French forces and American forces hunting down German surface raiders. Out of all proportion to their own military capability, but the more powerful the surface raider was, i.e. when it was the earlier Panzer Chief, Deutschland class, heavy cruisers, the larger and more powerful the units that it tied down hunting for it, which meant they weren't available to do other things. So if you have one of these wandering around the world, you have to pay attention. Again, the P-700 Granite, the shipwreck, the 750 kilogram conventional warhead or 500 kiloton nuclear warhead. That is not something you want sailing around the world's oceans unattended. Especially if you're its opponent. It's something you want sunk quickly. Hunt it down quickly requires a lot of noise will be made but also means that those ships which are hunting it down, those forces which are hunting it down, are not part of the Battle of North Atlantic. They're not part of the convoy battle which would be going on there. They're not part of the forces which are trying to take the Bastions. They're not part of the forces in the Mediterranean. They're not part of the forces anywhere where NATO would much prefer them to be. And the thing is, you take away a few destroyers. You take away a carrier battle group. You take away some submarines from those uh, fights, you could quickly see NATO having a problem. Because here is the dirty little secret. No matter how strong your allies, no matter how close to a thousand ship navy you are, your forces are still finite in numbers. You are only going to go to war with what you have, what you have, not what you'd like to have, what you have, and you're going to be fighting the battles with what is available, i.e. what is not damaged, what is not in major refit, what is not in outside the area doing other operations and beyond your ability to call in. Now, the Soviet Union cannot really affect what is under major maintenance. Damage, they, they're hoping to do that. But that's, again, a bit luck. But they can affect what is in the immediate area to be called upon, because, again, if they have something massive like one of these sailing around the world, probably NATO will have various ships wandering around after it anyway. And as the Cold War goes on and the numbers of ships actually starts to drop down, this will have a bigger and bigger impact. Because remember, those ships that are out there are drawn from the ships which aren't under major maintenance and are worked up. Ouch. And let's consider what this vessel has, what these vessels have. There is a bit of a change of them, unsurprisingly. So they are Project 1144. 
and they were supposed to be the largest and heaviest surface combatant warships in operation in the world. And nuclear powered guided missile cruisers. Now, originally, originally, this is what they're roughly fitted with. 24,300 tons standard, 28,000 tons fully loaded. A length of 252 meters, a beam of 28 and a half meters, a draft of 9.1 meters. Propulsion, two shaft combined nuclear and steam, CONAS. Propulsion supplied by two KN3 nuclear marine propulsion uh, uh, reactors with connected to two GT3A688 uh, steam turbines generating 140,000 shaft horsepower for a top speed of 32 knots. Or a range of 1,000 nautical miles at 30 knots. This is with combined propulsion, but unlimited at 20 knots on nuclear power alone. Complement 710. Uh, radars, well, we have the Vorkshod M8, MR800, or the top pair, 3D radar, it's on the foremast. Uh, the Fregat MR710, again, top plate, 3D search radar, mainmast. Two palm frond navigation radars on the foremast. Sonar, horse jaw, low frequency hull sonar, horse tail, VDS. Uh, variable depth center. Remember, some of these are the NATO reporting names. The electronic warfare and decoys included two PK2 decoy dispensers, each with 400 rockets. Missiles. I've already mentioned the 20s P700s, but they also had 96 S300s. This is on the Yushkov, Lazarev, and Nakimov. And that's otherwise known as the SAN-6 Grumble. 48 S300F forts and 48S300FM, Fort M, that's the SAN20 Gargoyle, it's on the Peter Veliki. Now, the Peter Veliki is what we call the youngest of the uh, these ships. Originally supposed to be called Yuri Andropov, a former general of the Secretary of the Communist Party, but her name was changed when, well, I should say his name was changed before, after the fall of the Soviet Union. Explain that point in a second. Uh, 64 3K95 Kinsals, that's the SA9 Gauntlets, uh, only installed on Peter Vlecky. Yeah. Space reserved for 128 missiles on Lazarev, Nakamov, and Vlecky. It's their point defense, Sam. 40 Ossa MAN7 SAN4 Gecko. Again, fitted to all, but Peter Veliki. And tw twin AK-130, that's 130mm dual-purpose gun. Two singles on Ushakov. And Ushakov started life as Kirov. Uh, eight six barrel Gatling 30 millimeter guns on Ushkov and Lazarev, and six CADs and one Gotik gun missile systems on Nakamov and Peter Veliki. There is a difference between the two classes, uh, two groups, but they aren't. They didn't include, uh, didn't decide to call one a uh, Project 1144 BIS or improved or batch. Right, torpedoes. Well, they carry ASW rockets and ten. 533 anti-submarine, uh, anti anti-surface warfare torpedo tubes. Always nice to know you're carrying a 21-inch torpedo. Armor, 76 millimeter plating around the reactor compartment, light splinter protection otherwise, and three helicopters of below deck hangar. So, fairly comprehensive missile system, fairly comprehensive capability. Now, the, these ships are all renamed after the fall of the Soviet Union. So Kirov becomes Ushakov, Lazarev, uh, Lazarev becomes Frunz, Nakimov become, uh, Kalin becomes Nakimov, Andropov becomes Peter Veliki. At the moment, Ushkov and Lazarev are both laid up to be scrapped. Some point, it was supposed to start in 2021, but honestly, we haven't heard anything. 
to confirm it. So at this current time, I would say I would think they'd be being processed or scrapped, but they're nuclear powered cruisers. It's going to take a time. Uh, Nakimov, that is X Kalin, the third young, uh, the third of the cruise of the ships, is undergoing a refit. And she was the one commissioned in 1988. Peter Velicki is in service with the Northern Fleet and was commissioned in 1998. Had started construction in 1986. What's interesting is the... original fifth ship was going to be called... Well, they went for Dzinski, October Revolution, you know, after October Revolution, the October Revolution, and then it went to the Soyuz Kuznetsov, and then the Admiral Flotara Sovetskogo. Always nice to pop around the different names. Cancelled in October 1990. Sad, really, for Russia, because honestly, these ships were pretty darn useful for them. It's like every time they bring up a plan for their new and um, super nuclear powered destroyer, you know what they're really looking for is a replacement for these. They're not really worried about carriers or status. It's having something which is going to give them equivalent presence to this vessel. And really, you can't beat these for presence. You really can't. Now, Kirov herself was laid down in March 1974 at a Basilki uh, naval shipyard, Leningrad, which had previously built two of the previous Kirov class cruisers. Launched December 1990, uh, 1977, commissioned December 1980, and currently, as I said, laid up to be scrapped. She was commissioned as part of the Northern Fleet. She first appeared in 1981. NATO observers decided to call her Balkan 1, Baltic Combatant 1, uh, which seems sort of strange because there's one place I wouldn't want to take these ships into. It's the Baltic. They probably, they, they do operate there, yes, but then honestly, there are places in this world I would not like to be in one of these ships, and one of them is the Baltic. Admittedly, it does fulfill the criteria for the Baltic of you either be small, numerous, and cheap, to, uh, easy to produce, and therefore de facto naval terms almost expendable, or you be so massive and overly power, uh, uh, overly powerful that you can actually survive fighting in the Baltic. Theoretically, it could form a second group, but really, it would need more armor for me to be thinking about that. During her second deployment. In the Mediterranean, she suffered a radioactive accident. Afterwards, she was placed into reserve and repairs were never carried out due to lack of funds. And in fact, was probably cannibalized as a spare parts cachet for the other ships in her class. She was renamed after Admiral Rushkov, the 18th century admiral, in 1992. But some interesting photos since then suggest it may have reverted to Kirov. Overhaul was started in 1999, but the ship was written off in 2001 and was supposed to be dismantled in 2003. In 2004, her name was transferred to a submarine class destroyer and it was revealed that the Surveillance Based Design Bureau, ANIGA, had been tasked with developing the dismantlement project for the cruiser. Hmm. However, the $40 million plan to dismantle her was halted when the Russian Navy decided to bring her back to service. In 2010, the Russian Navy again announced new plans for overhaul of, her, of Kirov, and it, the plan was to modify and reactivate all the Kirov battlecruisers, or cruisers as they really are, by 2020. However, in 2012, Ushkov and Lazarev were reported to have not be overhauled, due to being a state of being beyond repair. And the Zakrania uh, Zvetsonia uh, Bezrovka 
Shipyard, uh, CEO at the time, Vladimir Nitkin, claimed that it was dangerous to remove the spent nuclear fuel from the vessel's two reactors, given the fact the ship had been given minimum maintenance for 34 years. One of the things to note about these ships is they do have an active career. Um, Kirov, in terms of their appearing in media, uh, Kirov herself has appeared in Freds, um, colliding with the USS Caligan in the Persian Gulf, uh, The Hunt for Red October, and Red Storm Rising. In Red Storm Rising, it's sunk by a Norwegian submarine. Always fun. Anyway, the Baltic Shipyard. Now, this is why they get Baltic Combatant. But the OJSC Baltic Shipyard, uh, Bad City Savod, formerly also Shipyard 189, uh, named after Grigory Ozanskis, is, I would argue, the oldest shipyard in Russia that is a major shipyard. It's sometimes, like I said, it's one of the sh oldest shipyards in Russia, but I'd say it really is the oldest. That's actually still a major shipyard. At this yard, you wouldn't have been able to build the Kirovs. It launched the Prezos class battleship, the Borodino class battleships, the Borodino class battlecruisers being built, the Andrew Pezovsky class battleships, the Ganga class, the Konstad class, of course, the Svelda class. You know, uh, all of the these ships came from this yard. It is a critical facility for Russia. Without it, they wouldn't be able to build anything they have today. Because, especially when you they lost access to Ukraine, this yard became it for major surface construction projects. There are other yards which think, well, we can build this of frigates, we can build this. If you want to build something very big, very powerful, this is it. If you want to know where Russia will probably end up having to build an aircraft carrier if they build another aircraft carrier, probably this yard. If they want to build something that succeeds the Kirovs, it's going to probably be this yard. It's kind of like in the UK when we're building our aircraft carriers or building... There are very few yards which are big enough and have the technical skill. And you can either go for one or you can go for the other. And if one of those is in financial trouble, you're going to go for the other one. That's the options. For Russia, it's more limiting than that. Because some of the yards are well run and some of them are less so well run. Now, Frunz. Well... This is a picture of her in Abrek Bay in 2014. She had another interesting career. She's laid down in 1978, launched in May 1981, commissioned in October 1984. Uh, between August and November 1985, she sailed from North by the Cape, uh, from Russia North via uh, the Cape of Good Hope in Malacca Strait to join the Soviet Navy's Pacific Fleet. She visited Luanda, Aden, and Vietnam along the way. Great naval diplomacy mission. She conducted local waters training from 1987 to 1992. After this, she didn't really do much at this, uh, in this period. And then 1994 onwards was inactive. In 1999, she was taken out of service to prepare for scrapping. No money was considered available for its overhaul. However, in 2009, the ship was moored near Vladivostok in conservation status, and the Russian Navy announced they planned to modernize the ship and return to active service, provided that necessary funds were found. In 2012, it was considered beyond repair. However, Lazarev has appeared in aerial imagery between 2006 and 2014 to be moored here in our bay in a mothball fleet, six kilometers from the Russian nuclear-powered vessel decommissioning facility. In 
Now, it's still there, according to latest inventory. A contract has been signed in February 2021, apparently for its recycling. And some scrapping photos were posted in 2021, October 2021. But not much seems to be done. I don't think they're going to rea be reactivating the ship. It hasn't been maintained well enough. And it is the first generation of these ships, despite the fact that they were built, well, it's, you know, one of the joys of them is that they are built almost four years apart, each one, with Ushkov, that's Kirov, laid down in 1974, Lazarev, Frunz, laid down 78, Nakamov, laid down, oh, that's Kalin, and laid down 83, and Veliki, Andropov, laid down 86. So it goes four years apart between the first two, then five years between the second, number two and number three, and then three years between number three and number four. This gives a lot of time for evolution in between. This gives a lot of time for technology to move forward and for them to be changed, which makes them also, to an extent, each ship almost an individual version. Now, Nakamov is an even more interesting scenario because this is the ship which has been undergoing possibly the longest reactivation refit known to mankind, but which shows the value of these ships, in, especially in the Russian perspective. As Kalin, she was laid down in 1983, launched in April 1986, and commissioned in December 1988. Now, she joined the Northern Fleet in 1989, although technically she was supposed to be a global Pacific Fleet unit, uh, supposed to be a <clears throat> Pacific Fleet unit, and tended to operate globally was the theoretical, uh, the theory was that she'd be wandering between the two. In January 1991, she went on a long voyage to the Mediterranean Sea, and at the end of the Cold War, she's rarely deployed, permanently docked in smash awaiting repairs. In 2006, a decision was taken to make to modernize this ship, completing the construction, instead of completing the construction of the Belgrade. And she was undergoing refit from a shipyard in Savansk, but was finished ahead of schedule and announced to again be in service of the Northern Fleet. And that's always interesting when nations announce that, especially nations going through transitions like Russia was at the time. However, as far as we know, she's been docked in Zalanch since 1999 without um, any activity going aboard. In October 2008, Russian Navy representatives on Northern Fleet announced that the first modification of Nakamov had been started and the ship would be rejoined Navy Russian Fleet by 2012. This is 2022, it still hasn't rejoined, don't worry. In 2010, Nikolai Klausnov, the new director of Dashnov, repeated this statement. Confirming the Russian government had provided the money to be repaired in 2011, costing 50 billion rubles. But, despite 50 billion rubles, this was not enough, and it would cost more to bring the ship back to service. Then it was supposed to be joining the Pacific Fleet again. Then, by 2020, it's been reported she'll be staying as part of the Northern Fleet. Probably sensible for them to stay as part of Northern Fleet because you have the shipyards that can actually sustain them over this side of Russia. Again, as we discussed before in other videos, the shipyards in, on the uh, <clears throat> east of Russia are not really that many, that big, or that capable of dealing with the needs of these things. In 2012, they stopped the repairs because it was senseless to continue without having determined the final variant of modernization to. I, they didn't know what they were modernizing it to, so they didn't know what they were doing. At which point, Nakamov 
was sitting for two years and then resumed work in 2014, being planned to rejoin the Navy in 2018. This is a nice long story, so we'll keep on going. Yeah, she's slated now to carry, hopefully, 60 Zircon and Hypersonic anti-ship cruise missiles. But she's also been slated to carry Caliber cruise missiles and S-400s and all sorts of things are down on that slate. And there's a reason I'm using the phrase slate. Because it used to be that you would have used chalk to write on slate. And, you know, they would be you know, these lovely things. And then it could be rubbed out and you could write something on again. And this is why it's appropriate to use the phrase slated when it comes to Nakamov. Because she's always been, the, every time they make an announcement, they give her a new list of the sexiest, newest missiles are going to be fitted to her. In 2015, they announced that they finally finished removing the ship's old equipment and were beginning to start its installs replacement with new equipment in 2015. So, seven years ago. And additional changes were then by Ministry of Defense that required a new amendment to the contract, a new contract, which meant it was going to be delayed till 2022. Trials were due to begin in 2020. But in 2019, it was agreed, it was announced it was only 52% ready. So that's after, what, five years of work? And it's expected to be seen late in 2022. She was relaunched in August 2020. Expected to start sea trials in 2023 now. We think, we think, roughly between 160 and 180 VLS tubes. Now, usually the figure approach to is 174, but some sources have put 160, some put 180. Roughly, again, 80 for anti-surface and 94 for anti-air warfare. Roughly. And it's supposed to be SAN-6 Grumbles, SAN-22 Greyhounds... Possibly Zircon. Possibly Zircon. But definitely Calibre and various anti-submarine we weapons. But we just don't know. We really don't know because she isn't finished. Yuri Andropov, aka the Peter Veliki, aka when it goes around the world, everyone takes notice of it. This is the thing which is the sailing living example. She has had refits, and it's what's in so important about Nakamov is the moment she's actually out of refit, the Veliki can go in for the refit and upgrade. If we consider in 2021, she and the Marshal Ustinov, one of those very important. Slava class cruisers, the ones which were produced as insurance for these things, because if they went wrong, mm -hmm, they'd be in trouble. Were big status units which went for an ex went for various exercises. She has done many global deployments. She has been the Russian status ship going around the world, and she's far more reliable than an aircraft carrier. But she is only one ship. She is the status unit that the Russians sent out to hunt pirates. And there were even some reports of her using some of her very large missiles to hunt pirates. We'll leave that to one side. In 2014, she's part of this. A meet and greet in the channel. Uh, she's along with the uh, Kuznetsov at that, in that trip, uh, the tankers, Sergei Osprov, Kama and Duna, tugboat Atle, a Rapusha class landing ship, entered the English Channel to sail north. So you have the Kuznetsov and this. Let's be honest, this is the big status unit. This is HMS Dragon. This is a Type 45 destroyer. This is one of the biggest escorts which European navies have. Not quite as big as some of the Americans destroyers, but still fairly big, fairly powerful. 
There is a lot more distance than you would think between those two ships from that picture. And still, this looks a lot a little, looks smaller. They did a standard meet and greet because NATO, as always, has to shadow these ships. So there you go. One of the six Royal Navy Type 45 destroyers. One of six Type 45 destroyers they have. How many of their ships are available? Those will be available at any point. Well, if you've got six, you've probably got three available at best. So one third of the Royal Navy's available destroyer force needed for that job. That's them tying up ships. Have this class been successful? Well, the Soviet Union fell, so they didn't really get to do them. There are many, many points which I find strange when people talk about the Soviet Union, including that some people who say, well, they weren't really trying proper communism. It would have been different if they had. No, they really did go for trying to try proper communism. It's just all these things are not designed to be implemented by humans, but by perfect people. And in the end, designing a system to be implemented by perfect people is always going to fail. In this case, they have built a system which is being implemented by imperfect people. And it works. These ships are not matches in against the carriers. They're not the SATA ships which are going to match in the same as an aircraft carrier and go, yes, we have the power. Yes, we have the status. But they are going to be important. They are going to give you status because who else has them? And there's that classic task trip, the Kuznetsov and Akirov. Kuznetsov class and Akirov class. Peter Veliki and Kuznetsov sailing around the world together. That is status. That's a huge, great big ship to provide for protection for the carrier. The carrier's got its own firepower. Yes, a full battle group would be far more scarier with more ships to attend them, but those two at the centre of any task group, that's a task group which everyone has to pay attention to. And that's what they're going for. So, nuclear-powered status in peacetime, presence ships, global presence ships. In wartime, task group heads, firepower, battle line, and, well, commerce raiders, distractions. Ruse de guerre. Without being quite such a ruse, but still a ruse, still a diversionary forces. Were they worth it? Yes. Are they battle cruisers? Well, that's an interesting question. I think I would usually myself consider them super cruisers rather than battle cruisers, and I have a reason for that. Please note. For them to be battle cruisers and nuclear power battle cruisers. It's not that I expect them to have more armor. It's I expect them to be slightly bigger. The th that's the thing. If we uh, we do a lot of conversation of being their equivalent in size to a World War One battle cruiser, yes, but there is also something else in the world which was not that far off them. In fact, was bigger than them. The Alaska-class cruiser, which weighed in at 30,000 tons in standard and 34,800 tons fully loaded. The fact that that exists in the world, and I would maintain that an Alaska-class is a cruiser. It's a cruiser built in a world where Montana's and... Iowa's are in existence, where all the where the battleships and battle crews of the capital ships have got up to sixty to eighty thousand tons. Then yeah, they're cruisers, 
And you cannot call a Kirov class a battle cruiser, no matter how sexy and powerful it is, if it you don't call an Alaska class a battle cruiser. An Alaska class isn't a battle cruiser because by the time it comes about the 10,000 ton limit is no more and the ships you're dealing with in terms of capital ships are twice as heavy as that. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you found it interesting and I hope you enjoyed part two. There are going to be more Soviet ships covered in this cruiser series. Uh, we have the Sveldov class coming up in November. Some of my favourites. I wrote a very interesting paper on them to my, uh, to my mind. The Shapiev class are coming up in September. And we also have the Dadless class um, coming up, which of course famously did have a Russian vessel in them. So... Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed and uh, take care. And in terms of lives, we have next week Wayne Boring's Infrastructure in the Colonies, Shipyards of Commonwealth and Empire. Oh, and if you would like a live on Soviet cruisers and a live discussion of them, I haven't put one in because honestly, with a all the real building of the office, there hasn't been much time and space to think about that. I have got the various books and I have done something similar before, so I will happily do a live. I would, you know, it's what people can think about. And I always finish these videos with a question. And so the question is this. We know what the Kirols were. They're super cruisers. Okay, if we're going to call them anything a super cruiser makes sense, but probably just a proper cruiser. As in this generation of Kirov's. Now, whilst I doubt America would have built anything equivalent, because let's be honest, they're building enough aircraft carriers, that's their status unit, they're not going to change. If in the 1970s, the British government had turned around, let's say the British, or possibly the French, had turned around and gone, well, we'll build an equivalent status unit. We're going to build a status cruiser. We're going to build a statement status cruiser. What do you think it would look like? What do you think kind of, what kind of systems would they have put in on it? Right, if you think about it, if Kirov herself is laid down in 1974. She's commissioned 1980. So let's say post Falklands War. One of Thatcher's points she decides to do is we are going to build an equivalent. Would it be nuclear powered, do you think? What would it have looked like? What would it have been armed with? I'd be really interested in hearing what people say because you've got the in 1980, you've got the Lazarev being launched in 1981. You've got the Nakamov laid down in 1983. So if you're 1983, 1984, you know the Russians are at least getting three of these ships. So you decide you're going to order a couple of equivalents to pair up with your Invincible class. What would you build? What do you think the would they go gas powered? How big would they be? What would they arm with? Uh, I'd really like to see what people think. And again, for the French, who usually have less carriers than the British do. The British tend to have more aviation ships. They're smaller, but the British tend to have more heart or more flight decks than the French do. So the British tend to have more reliable in terms of availability of the air power. What do, let's say the French do the same. What would it look like? And I'm going to add in a third nation because I just want to put some can amongst pigeons. What would you think the Italians would design one to look like? Because I think all three of those could build a nuclear powered surface ship if they wanted to. All three of them have the capacity to. I know 
Italy doesn't have nuclear submarines, but Italy has the technological base, they could probably do it. And so I'd be really interested to see what people think those nations' response to a Kirov class could have been. If you want to put in what you think the American response would look like as well, I'd be really interested to see that. But I just think America is less likely to go down that route than to go down the carrier route, which would probably be more theirs. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed and uh, take care.